Well, good morning to you all. Welcome to our service. It's nice to be back with you after being away for a fortnight. Uh, and here we're gathered as we share in our worship together. Let's do that by reading the first uh, two verses of the 90th Psalm. It is entitled, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. So, verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 90. Do read with me. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from ever to nothing to everlasting, you are God. Well, may we know that truth, and let's sing truth now, as uh, we have our opening hymn. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. Stunning to sing, oh, for a thousand tongues. Thank you. 
Let's uh, continue together as uh, so we pray and uh, come before our God. Let's do that now. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we've been able to sing praise and rejoice together and uh, lift our voices as one in worship to you. We pray that each of us would know the reality and the truth of that worship, that we come before you, the living, righteous and holy God. We thank you that uh, there was never a time where you were not, that God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit uh, existed in, in all time. You are the maker of time. And uh, we thank and praise you that we can then come before you as uh, men and women and sing praise to you, a holy God. We thank you that you've declared yourself and shown yourself in the world that you have made and in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we've got uh, every evidence of these truths of yourself in the scriptures that we're able to read and study and consider. We thank you that we have the 66 books of the New Testament and the Old Testament that make up our Bible, the Word, the Holy Word of God. And it's telling us who you are and all that we need to know about you is to be found in these uh, words. So Lord, help us to uh, understand afresh your speaking voice to us this morning and that we can worship and honour and praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here, uh, young and old, gathered in this, uh, this uh, church to praise you. And we thank you for your blessings upon us, how you have been keeping us. Some have been away uh, and others will be going away. Some have had to remain at home, maybe uh, all through the summer. Whatever the situation is, we are here today and we can enjoy one another's company in God's Word and in Christ. And for those that are having to be in their homes today for whatever reason, and as they follow us on screen, uh, we pray that you'll just bless them. And as they participate in the service as we have it, uh, that they also will know something of your speaking voice into their lives uh, throughout this day and in this morning. And so we commit our time to you. We pray that you'll help us to honour you in everything that we will, we will do this morning as we read, as we pray, as we sing, as we contemplate your word, as we gather around uh, the table to eat of the bread uh, and the cup. We pray, our Father, uh, that uh, you will bless us and help us to be stirred in our hearts and uh, once again be captivated by the glory and the wonder of you, a holy God, Lord gather our thoughts, enable us in our hearts and minds, and uh, we pray that you will watch over us, for it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, read together uh, our catechism question uh, for the day and uh, give some contemplation on it uh, with regards to the question. So do follow on the screen and read the answer and the scripture. So our question, question 32, is what do justification and sanctification mean? <coughs> justification, have we got it? Thank you. Justification means our declared righteousness before God, made possible by Christ's death and resurrection for us. Sanctification means our gradual growing righteousness made possible by the Spirit's work in us. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. To those who are elect exiles, according to the... Uh, let me read it. I'll just read this. To those who are elect exiles, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. What do justification and sanctification mean? Well, justification is God's act to make us and declare us 
absolutely right and perfect. We can't do that ourselves. We can't do it by merit. We can't do it by works. We can't do it by achieving things. It has to be God that will declare us perfect and right. He is the only one that can do so. And so it's a legal word and it gives us legal standing before a holy God who cannot look upon sin and yet it makes it possible for us to be in his presence. And that's only possible because of our union with Jesus Christ. And it's by faith alone that we are then justified. So justification is God's act to say that we are perfect and right and have Christ's righteousness. Sanctification is also an act of God as he works in us something of his wonder and his glory to make us more like Jesus. Though we have been um, made perfect or the, uh, the legal requirement has been met and God says we are perfect, we live in this world understanding that we sin. So though God sees us perfect, in the reality as we live, it's God then that is making us perfect and that's through sanctification. And perfection will be reached and known when we are glorified, another Bible word, when we get to heaven. And so it's a very important, uh, uh, two important words in the Bible, justification and sanctification. So the writer puts it this way. He says another way, to say it is like this, the power by which you daily strive to overcome the imperfection of your life is the confidence that you're already perfect. So, as we strive, because we battle, we know that God sees us for who we are. We must not get those twisted around, or else we will think that somehow we need to work to be perfect. We need to do things to be acceptable to God. God wants us to do good things, but he will uh, enable us to do that as we grow in faith. <clears throat> Let me pray. Our Saviour and Lord, you have completed the work of our justification. You have begun the work of our sanctification, and we trust that you will carry us through to its completion. Transform us day by day into your likeness, conforming us to your ways. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing a hymn uh, as we pick up uh, the rich themes that we have in God's Word and in these hymns. Holy Father, rich in mercy, Holy Saviour, rich in grace, great in glory, everlasting, how I long to see your face. Standing to sing uh, this hymn. <laughs>
as we are gathered this morning, so it being the first Sunday of uh, a new month, then we are coming to take the bread and the cup as we commemorate the Lord's Supper, the communion service, a variety of names. But we're gathered at this meal, symbolic meal, to eat and to drink and to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So please do participate as we are served with the, the, the bread and the cup. Uh, uh, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour, then you take these elements. Uh, if not, then just allow them to pass. And as I've indicated, give some thought to the significance of all that Christ has done and how he has loved us. And may we respond to that love and that grace. <laughs> I want to read a few verses from Hebrews uh, chapter 1. And, uh, and then we, we will take the, the bread and cup. Uh, Trevor and Neil will join with me and Trevor will, will give thanks uh, for the elements. So let's read Hebrews uh, chapter 1, just a few verses from verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, and he ministers, his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated, hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. When we have the writer to the Hebrews uh, writing his letter, preaching his sermon, he's preaching and speaking to a group of people who are are Hebrews, uh, Jews, and they are being tempted to look back to the old ways, uh, the old sacrificial system, uh, look back to Moses, look back to the angels, look back to what they thought was the great demonstration of who God is. But of course now we have something else. And as they've been tempted to think of what's gone, they need to look at what has gone because it pointed forward to the better, which is Jesus. And so the writer is at pains to demonstrate that King Jesus, who came into this world, is the express image of a holy God. He is God, God the Son. And so uh, every description that we have in Hebrews 1 is identifying something of who he is, and that our hope and our salvation and everything that we are is then rooted in all that he has accomplished and everything that he has done. And so may we then this morning come, not coming to a sacrificial system because it's no more and needs to be no more. We come to the great sacrifice, King Jesus, who gave his life that ransom for many. So take, eat and drink and give glory to our God and to our King. So let's uh, gather to this table and say, uh, Trevor and Neil join with me and uh, Trevor will pray and uh, give thanks. Our Father God, we thank you for this wonderful table that is set before us, this feast. Lord, to our eyes it may not look like a feast, Lord, but spiritually it's so significant in the fact that it reminds us mm. of all that Christ did for us on the cross, that his body was mm. broken and that that blood was shed. And that was for us, Lord, those who 
uh, far away from you at the time, Lord. We did not want to know you. We were far from you, Lord, and we were um, covered in sin, Lord, as it mm. were. And yet, Lord, you chose us, Lord. You forgave us, mm. and you have given us that wonderful uh, hope that we have in Christ from all that he has done on that cross, Lord. We just pray that as we take of these emblems, Lord, we recognise they are just pieces of bread, Lord, and they're just fruit juice. But, Lord, they have that, a wonderful power, Lord, which is just the, the salvation that we have in Christ. And so, Lord, as we take of these things, Lord, help us to remember all that you went through, for the cross that you bore, for the pain and the suffering, for the separation from God the Father, all that you went through, and you did it for us. And, Lord, we just want to thank you for that this morning. And we pray that as we take of these things, Lord, we will think upon them. And, Lord, that it will indeed encourage us lord in our walk with you it will strengthen our faith and it will help us to go out into this new week mm -hmm. and to save you lord because you have done given everything for us lord mm -hmm. just help us lord to give our lives fully devoted to you and all that we do lord help us with the get our get, guide of the holy spirit lord mm -hmm. to enable us to do these things we pray and we ask all this in jesus name amen amen amen, amen. Now we're going to be served with the bread, do retain it, and we will eat together once everybody has been served. Thank you. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will roll them up, like a garment they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. Now we're going to be served with the cup again. Please do retain that and we will drink uh, together uh, as we have been served. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance 
of me. That is strange. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we have been able to, to eat and drink and we are fully satisfied. We, as it were, leave the table knowing that you have uh, fed us and fed us well. Lord, we would pray that we would know the reality of your word then in our hearts so that we are sustained and spiritually renewed so that we can live and uh, know your liberty. Thank you that we can gather as a church family and we are aware of many different people within our church that are maybe facing struggles and challenges, in particular those who maybe no longer can meet with us and there they are in places of care uh, or whatever their condition. And we would pray you'll minister into them. Some confused of mind and we just pray for some moments of clarity where there is that sense that uh, you are with them and sustaining them and uh, whatever in on those other occasions uh, we pray our father uh, we that you will enable them and keep them in perfect peace pray for those that uh, are unwell or in hospital and we would particularly pray this morning uh, for Ilala, we thank you for her and we pray for her and sang. Uh, we think of the different circumstances over these past uh, uh, weeks which have just uh, identified something of your blessing and your help to them, uh, answers to prayer in a variety of ways. And so we commend them to you again and trust for Ilala and her recovery, recuperation and convalescence and uh, gaining strength. Minister to her and bless her today and uh, watch over her as we know you are. So we commend them to you, our lives to your care. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you can be ready to put your cups back in the trays as, uh, uh, the, uh, as they come around to get those, we're going to sing a hymn, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord. Of my heart, not be all else to me, say that thou art. Let's stand and let's sing uh, the hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
Let's be seated. Let me remind you of one or two things for the week ahead. Of course, we are in the summer period, so the program itself slows down a little bit. But there are many other things going on. We want to pray for those who will be away uh, from us. Uh, Naomi, at the moment, is at the Contagious Youth Camp. Uh, which uh, started uh, yesterday uh, in the rain. Uh, hopefully, we'll get uh, they'll get a little bit better weather over the week itself. So we pray for that. And of course, she gets back and uh, she's off to uh, Benlech uh, to do two weeks in the uh, beach mission. Uh, and there are others uh, involved in all sorts of other things up and down the country. And uh, so let's pray uh, for those activities that we're associated with. The Indigenous Youth Camp, and as we'll be going to uh, the one uh, in a fortnight's time, we value your prayers for all of that. But next Sunday, God willing, we'll be here at 11 o'clock, and now we'll be speaking at our morning service. Uh, we'll hope to do, and we've hoped to have done, uh, one or two prayer meetings in the course of uh, the summer weeks. So That's not always practical or possible. But we will do one on this Wednesday at half past seven. It'll be in the back hall. Uh, I'll be there. If you can join me, then come along. If you can't, don't worry. Um, but uh, if you can be with us uh, on Wednesday, there may only be a few, uh, just a, a time of prayer as we think uh, forward uh, for the future of the church, as we've called, uh, uh, called Eddie and, and Kat to be with us. want to pray about that. Uh, but there are other matters as well uh, that we can just uh, seek God about and pray, and not least the things that are going on over the summer also. Uh, Liverpool City Mission have their prayer diary, which is now available. Uh, I think that's for the next uh, quarter or next couple of months. Um, so you can you can get that at the back. And uh, if you pray for Liverpool City Mission, then uh, on each day, uh, a little note to, um, uh, to pray for whatever it might be. So just be mindful of that, pick it up on the way out, if you wish. Right, let's uh, sing uh, another hymn just before we read the Bible and then make some comment uh, on God's Word as we teach it and share it uh, together. This hymn, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your Holy Word and let us to be in uh, preparation to do that and that help as we sing it. Speak, O Lord. Yeah. 
seated. If you could turn in your Bibles to the second psalm, then that's where we're going to focus our thoughts uh, this morning, Psalm 2. The Psalms, of course, have 150 chapters. We call them Psalms, 150. It, uh, it is the songbook of the Hebrew people. Um, and uh, towards the end, we have uh, five or six Psalms that uh, all end with, with hallelujah. There's a element of great praise associated uh, with this book. And uh, it's split up into five books, uh, and you will see that as you read through it. Uh, there are five sections, and each section ends. Lord God Israel, be blessed forever. Amen and amen. So it's a structured book, not just a higgledy-piggledy uh, bunch of uh, writings that have been put together, but put together with purpose and with a structure. And Psalms 1 and 2 are an introduction, as it were, to the whole of the book. We're only going to be looking at Psalm 2 today. Um, and, but it's a psalm which identifies who God is. It's also, it's a song book, but it's also a book of prayer. And it can be used in that way. And that, let me encourage you, there might be days when you find it hard to pray. And sometimes praying a psalm can be very helpful. There are psalms of great praise. There are also psalms of lament, of tragedy. And that's our experience. And sometimes where we can't speak, this psalm speaks for us as we cry out to God. And so let me encourage you in that. But let's read Psalm 2 uh, as uh, we make some comment on it. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision. And then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. We sometimes sing uh, a, a chorus, and in there's a, a newer hymn that contains this chorus as part of it, uh, and we will probably sing it at some point in the future. Our God is a great big God. Uh, and we know that is not depicting size, massive, big, but something of his character, of who he is. We really know description of God, because he's a spirit. And man was commanded not to make any graven image depicting God. And that's where the children of Israel fell down. They, they made that uh, graven image and worshipped it in replacement in, 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 in of God. So to describe God, how do we talk about him? We talk about him and his love. God is love. God is just. God is holy. That's how we speak about God. We look at our world and uh, we see God overshadows all of it. The song, it's a wonderful, wonderful world. has got that bit right, whatever else it sings. It's wonderful because it's designed, ordered and put together by God. And so we have the exploration of space. We have the Images being back from Mars, for example. Remarkable pictures of outer space. 
that we can't see with the naked eye, but such is the technology that allows us to have a little glimpse into the skies or into the depths of the oceans. But this world, whether it's the heights of the heavens or the depths of the, the oceans, is all saying the same thing. It is put there by God, ordered by him, and sustained by him. We read something of that in, in that book of Hebrews, chapter 1. That's why we read it. By the word of his power, it was brought about, but by the word of his power, it is kept. Yes, we've got gravity. Yes, we've got the uh, ordered physical nature of our world, but it's God who actually sustains and maintains it all. This is the God who holds everything in his hand. This is the one who has control and determines all things. This is the sovereign ruler who rules all. But how do we live? Well, we live, particularly in a Western society with its affluence and its progress, uh, as if there is no God and he doesn't matter. Well, this psalm wants to set out some important sight lines as to how we understand who God is. And it starts in, a, in an interesting way, asking a question, verse 1, why do the nations rage? And if it's about kingship, which it is, verses 1 to 3, as we will note, is actually society saying, we want to be king. So those verses where the kings of earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. We know this is a psalm of David. It hasn't got an attribution here in this psalm, but when the New Testament speaks about Psalm 2, and it is one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament, and in Acts chapter 4 it speaks about this psalm as a psalm of David. A king, when he is first put in place, may well be vulnerable to attack. Enemies might see it as a moment to flex their muscles and come before him before he gets set, before he gets established. Or they may be saying, well, we're not going to have this king ruling us. If a king is expanding and taking other nations, well, we're not having this uh, king uh, who will rule our nation, even though. He's usurped, usurped every power that's part of that nation. We're not going to serve this king. And they imagine, it seems, in the language of Psalm 2 in the opening verses, they, they imagine that they will overturn this kingship. And they will endeavor to do so at every point. Now, of course, it's not just restricted to nations that come against uh, particularly David. But also, even within his own family, there's a point where Absalom comes against David and says, we don't want you as king, I'm going to be king. And David has to go on the run and get out of the country or get out of Jerusalem. And it's Absalom that then says, I am the reigning king. Of course, he never was, and he's quickly taken out of the picture. So here, these people... And it seems the whole range of society is identified as they plot, as they plan, as they seek to come against this king, King David, or any king for that matter. And the bottom line is that they want to rule their own lives. They're of the opinion that the life offered by the king is one that might restrict them, limit their freedoms. They're unwilling to recognize the authority of the Lord, the Anointed One. So the reality of Psalm 2 is that these people are not coming against some earthly ruler, but they're opposing God himself. And that's the nature of you and me and humanity. In our rebellious state, we are coming against God. We don't want God to rule our lives for all sorts of reasons. I don't believe in God. Or if I do believe in God, I can't believe uh, the God of the Bible. Look at what mess he has made, some people say. And they have all sorts of descriptions. But he's not going to rule my life. He's not going to order my existence. 
I am going to be king. It's my right to live my life, and it's my right to take my life, as it were. And that certainly is the language of a society that we live in that says it's our destiny, we're in charge, we're in control, and nobody can tell us what to do, even and the, the ending of life itself. So verses 1 to 3 is identifying this opening reality that they don't want this kingship, we want to be our own kings. It's the language of our world. The second thing is in verses 4 to 6, where we have identified the fact that God is the king. Whatever these nations are saying, and whatever power they may exert, it is nothing compared to the one that sits in the heavens and laughs. The reality is that as these, this humanity goes about its business, saying, well, we don't want this God, or we don't want this king, and they shake his, their fist at him as if somehow they can defeat him, as, as if somehow they can get rid of him, as if somehow they can ignore him, God just looks and laughs as if you can do anything to damage me. Why can you not? He holds them in derision. He will speak to them in his wrath. He will terrify them. I have my king. I will do my plans. I will have my purposes. Nothing will stop them. He's in absolute control. The psalm is a poetic one, of course. It's painting a picture. And the reality is that all the nations are accountable to God. And that holds good in the day of David, and it holds good in 2023. That every power, no matter what it looks like, and no matter where it comes from, is accountable to God. It doesn't matter whether it's Russian or American or Chinese or anything in between. Whether it's a big power or a small power. Whether it's a massive government or something a little bit smaller. Everyone and every person <laughs> is accountable to the living God. The one God. The creator God. And so this picture of them taking counsel against God is uh, it, 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 it's like a, 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 a mouse going to attack a lion. I mean, it would be ridiculous. I think it might be a kind of children's story where the mouse kind of comes up victorious, but that's only in a story. Uh, it is ludicrous to think that this little thing could, in any which way, disturb the king of the jungle. And who can in any way disturb the Creator. It is impossible. God is the Creator God. He is the one then that has the final answer and the one who everybody is answerable to. It's not something which is given much thought today. God is the one that we control. That's how humanity operates. We make the God that we want so that that's the God that serves me. That's the sort of God I want. The God that when I flick my fingers, he comes. Uh, the God that when I've got a problem, he sorts it all out. And makes my life just very enjoyable. That's the sort of God that humanity creates. Not the one that controls us, but we control him. Not the one who orders our lives, but we order him. And if it's all well in our world, then we, 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 take, the, we, we, we take the praise. It's going well in my life. But if it goes wrong, suddenly God has messed up again. Well, here we are being met with the fact that God is king. He's the ruler and the one in charge. And that's something awesome and something that we need to give serious consideration to. The third thing, and then we're going to have two application points as we finish. The third thing, if you've got in verses 7 to 9, is that David is the king. God has set 
his king in place. He's given him the power and the authority. He's the one that represents, as it were, God. We have a priesthood and we have a sacrificial system, but the nature of the kings in, uh, in the minds of the Jew was that they represented and stood for God before the people. He, they had his authority and they were recognized as one closely associated with God or should have done. And David then becomes God's representative. He, he is the king who will do God's will and act on God's behalf. He's the one to guide the people, to be the protector and the deliverer. Now we know, of course, that David doesn't always get it right, and no king did. And we'll come to that in a few moments. But here, there is the reality that uh, is decreed by God himself, that David is set as the one that has been appointed, and the one that is to uh, rule, and the one that is to deal with in the way that he does, bringing judgment upon the nations or bringing blessing to his people. Those two things will happen through David. And so these, these three elements are very much part of this psalm, setting out who God is. We want to be king, God is king, but David is the king in representing God himself. Two points of application. And the first point of application for them and for us is that we need to let God be king. You can pick that up, particularly in verses 10 to 12, as uh, there's this exhortation, Now therefore, O kings, be wise. What have you done? You've set yourself against God. But there's an opportunity, there's a time, there's a moment when you can reflect, you can give some thought to the stupidity of this action. You can't come against God. It is impossible. Reflect on that. Be wise. There's the warning here. If you don't, then there's going to be a problem. But you, what you can do is serve the Lord. You can recognize the kingship. You can recognize my purposes. Actually, my purposes are for your good. Even if you disdain them and want nothing to do with them. So they need to realize the logic of everything that David has been arguing in this psalm. That if God be God, then to live in total freedom and total liberty, God needs to be the king of their lives. And though they may be ruled by God, they're going to be living in freedom. Because actually, we're all ruled by something. And better to be ruled by the creator, the maker, who has given us breath and only knows what's good for us than something else. So it's the recognition that if they go their own way, they must accept the consequences of that. But the creator God offers that which is much better. So the offer for you and for me this morning is exactly the same. To realize that we can't fight against God, that he is in total control, and that we yield to him. He's our only hope, and he's our great blessing to us. We no longer say, I want to be king of my life. I want to rule my life. I want to be what I want to be. We say, Lord Jesus, take my life. You know him, take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to thee. Take my moments and my days. Take everything. Here it is. I yield to you. You're my master. That's the first application. The second application is something that David would not have seen but pointed towards. And all of Israel actually anticipated something that was to come. And that's why we read Hebrews. Because in Hebrews we have the, this one of these verses taken up, pointing to the reality that the king has come, the true king, the one that has been set aside by a holy God. David was set aside, but there is another king that has been set aside, and that, of course, is Jesus. And this psalm is referred to on numerous occasions right throughout the New Testament. 
And on each occasion, the speaker takes the verse and applies it to Jesus. Whether it's in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 13, whether it's in Mark chapter 1 or in Revelation or in Hebrews, uh, the end point and the application point is always the same. Psalm 2 is speaking about Jesus. It's thousands of years prior to the event, but it's pointing forward unerringly to him. So that in the New Testament and in the church, and when they sing Psalm 2 uh, as believers, whether they were in Ephesus or whether they're in Corinth or wherever they are, and they sing this psalm, they're singing about Jesus. They're singing his praise. And that's what they grasp, and that's what they get. And when we sing, that's exactly what we are doing. Singing about our Saviour. So what is being taught is the fact that Jesus is then king. He's the final ruler and authority. And as such, everybody is answerable to him. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. So the knees bow here, as it were, before this king. But every knee is going to bow before the great king. Whether it's the Russian president or the president in China or the president in America or a prime minister of our country or whoever it might be, from prince to pauper, will all bow before the king. King Jesus. Some people ignore Jesus, some people resist Jesus. Everybody wants to be king of their lives, and the teaching of Jesus tells us that when he is king, then we're living in freedom and liberty. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. So the living hope and the blessing that we have is the truth that we're in Christ Jesus. So I leave us with a question this morning that we can reflect upon. Who is king of your life? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you this morning and we're very conscious that uh, we often rather want to live our own way and do our own thing. Forgive us for that. Help us to understand who you are and help us this morning to come and say, Christ is my king. He is my master. I will not go out free. And we yield to you. We bring our sin and we say, I'm sorry. We repent and we turn to Christ. Lord, help us to do so. And that we may know that true, benevolent, wonderful, loving kingship that knows only our good. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing our final hymn. The Lord is King. Lift up your voice. O earth and, hope, uh, and all ye heavens rejoice, from world to world the joy shall ring, the Lord omnipotent is King.
Heavenly Father, we pray that that will be the cry of our hearts, that the Lord is King. We pray that you'll be with us for the remainder of this day, that you'll watch over us. We pray that you'll keep us and enable us to do all that you'd have us to do. And we will give you the glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do be seated. Mind you, the refreshments provided in the back hall do go through and uh, take of those and uh, let's enjoy one another's uh, company and conversation. Thank you.